What's up all my plant lovers? I have a fun video for you guys today. I wanted to do a whole house tour of all of the plants in all of the different rooms in my home. Now, last time that I did a full house plant tour was about a year and a half ago, and it was pretty much just confined to this room behind me. Um, since then, we've done a, we made like tons of changes to the interior of our, of our house and um, made changes to where I now feel that plants should be on display in those areas before. Before those areas needed updating, they needed changes, and they were not worthy of plants. Now they are. And so I wanted to do, um, uh, I wanted to revisit my houseplant jungle behind me, um, but I also wanted to show you guys some of the different areas of our home where we are also incorporating plant life in a little bit of a different manner. Now, just a little preface. Um, my houseplant jungle behind me, this is all like my design kind of energy. Whereas the plant material that we use in the rest of the home is definitely Samantha's um, design perspective. So she has a much more kind of clean energy flowing. Whereas me, I like the jungle. Um, I like a lot of plant life because, you know, this is my office. This is where I live all day, every day. And I like, I get bored. I like to see and look and have fun um, enjoying all the different plant life. So without further ado, let's get this tour started. Well, so the first thing that you'll notice behind me is that we put all those different slats on the walls, which is super cool. You can see all these guys. So about, I don't know, maybe three or four months ago, I took all of the plants out had them in storage into uh, basically our uh, spare room. And we gave a nice fresh coat of white paint. And then we put these slats on the wall so I could create my own living wall, which we're growing some mini monsteras um, and a couple other different plants up this living wall. And I'll show you guys that here in a second. But let's start with the corner that you can't see right behind us. So. One of the things that I've been doing as I live at this home longer and I just you know have fun trying to find new ways to maximize space is I've created a lot of my own furniture for plants, of course. Um, and I've been making a lot of like simple little benches like this. And you know, the more I do it, the better I get at it, the sturdier that they become. And this guy looks pretty cute. And I, right now I have one of my amaryllis that I've, it was outside all summer long and I've just brought it inside and it's looking great. Um, this year I decided I have so many amaryllis grown out of my ears that I'm not going to do any sort of special treatment. A lot of them actually bloomed throughout the summer, so I'm just going to let it grow, see what happens. I'm not going to put it into, into that dormancy period, which typically right now would be the dormancy um, time. Now over here I have, so in my house growing I have two different uh, fish bone zigzag cactus. And this, I, you know, if you have insight and know what's what, please leave a comment below and help me figure it out because this one I believe is the Daiso cactus anguliger, anguliger. I don't know, that pronunciation is probably terrible. And you can see the foliage is like, you know, relatively narrow, maybe about an inch um, in width. Whereas I have another one which we'll see later, which I believe is a uh, Selenocerius zigzag cactus, like Selenocerius anthocyanus, um, which is a different look than this guy. But so outside, this was outside all summer and it just exploded in growth. It's so the way I've got it go growing is it was in a hanging basket. This had like a hanging sort of situation and it was hanging outside and I've since put it into this little uh, placeholder pot. And it looks pretty good in here, actually. And now it's inside. So over here I have like one of my four uh, snake plants, my Cylindrica snake plants, Sansevieria, Sansevieria uh, Cylindrica, which these plants are probably my favorite of all of the snake plants. They look kind of like those like weapons that the uh, that a ninja would use, you know, like those prongs. Um, that's why I would, every time I look at them, I think of that, which is, Super cool. Um, this guy was not getting enough light, so it actually started to flop. And uh, let's see if I take it a while. You can see this guy over here is just getting a little bit floppy. So I actually have it propped up against the wall just to give it some extra support. It is true, snake plants can handle quite a bit of 
darkness in the home, but after a while they will start to suffer. So you do need to bring them back into areas with more light to help them kind of strengthen back up. Now over here you can see one of my Raphidophora tetraspermas, the mini monsters. These guys just have absolutely exploded in growth since I started them. Um, I started this plant, this was a, a cutting that I took from my other plant over here and you know, within six months it had just reached this size. Now it's taking, the thing about growing mini monsters is that they're rapid growers when they start really taking off, but when you take a cutting and then you root it in water is typically the easiest way to do it. Then you replant it. It's actually very, they're, they're quite slow to get acclimated again. So once they're growing, they grow like gangbusters, but they can really take quite a bit of time to really get to that point. So be patient if you're growing your mini monster and you just see nothing happen, happening. This guy, nothing happened for like six months. And then all of a sudden it took off and it hasn't stopped. Um, let me show you guys how I have it situated with the wall. Now the only thing is having these plants with the wall is like they're pretty permanent in where they're staying. So initially I thought let's do like uh, fish wire to kind of keep it in there and then I would like put tape. You know, you can see I have like tape here so that the fish wire wouldn't cut into the stem. But after a while I realized that was not very good. It was just too challenging to do. So what I've started to do, I'm putting some tacks in here to just give it some support. And where needed, I use just like a little twist tie to actually keep it going and staying up. And that seems to be working. Um, with just this one little grow light here, it's doing pretty well. Now, in my opinion, no house plant garden is complete without a classic flamingo flower. I've got about three or four of these around here. Um, just because they add so much color for so long. Anthurium andranum, I think is the pronunciation. I've never really known how to pronounce that one. The one thing that people find challenging is, is I'm actually suffering from it right now with one of my other ones, is that they'll kind of reach a point where they stop flowering. And the best thing to do when you get to that point is to uh, take it out, refreshen it, and give it a new pot, give it some new soil, give it, a like, it's basically like flushing it with new nutrients. That really seems to do the trick. If you're finding that your uh, flamingo flower is just not really blooming as profusely as it should, or not blooming at all. And of course, over here is my Christmas cactus. Now, this plant is just starting to bud up, which is great. Um, what I normally have during like the summertime when it's not blooming, it's under a, a single like pretty nice grow light, gets great light. So I just moved it out of the lighting um, to help encourage that new flower formation. You know, I have a nice video showing you guys some really kind of like in-depth um, tips for getting your Christmas cactus to bloom. And while those tips are great for, you know, if you're really struggling, if you haven't gotten it to bloom in a long time, definitely follow those tips. Otherwise, you know, if you're a little bit more f low maintenance and you're, you know, and how intensive you want to go about your plant care, um, just simply moving it to a place with less light tends to just do the trick as well. Um, you know, the days are getting shorter. I have it kind of away from any of the grow lights, so it definitely gets a good like 12 hours of darkness. And that seems to be good. Also, the changing in the temperatures is hugely important for initiating the buds. So one of the things that will stress out the buds, um, if you're getting those buds to just form and then they seem to dry up and kind of fall off, that happens a lot if you let your soil get too dry while they're budding up. Um, if it gets too hot where they're situated, like if they just have too much heat, that can also cause that to happen. Um, and I know that's a very common problem um, with Christmas cactus growers. Okay, so starting off this plant wall, I have this old Acamea uh, bromeliad, which is just kind of hanging on. Uh, this has been my most neglected plant in my houseplant jungle. Um, I've had this for probably five years. It hasn't bloomed in a long time. It hasn't made any babies in a long time. I often go many, weeks without watering it and it's still hanging on. It doesn't look great, but um, I would love for it to have a, make, a, make a pup and bloom, but it just won't do it. 
but it's still a pretty cool like low key energy that it has around here. So that's all right. And that is a type of bromeliad, particularly in Akamea. Now here you can see my other Raphidophora tetrasperma have just creeping and crawling. Now the plan is for this guy to climb up and eventually meet with this guy, um, maybe in another year or two, slowly taking its time. Another amaryllis, which is great uh, because it has produced a side growth over the summertime. So I'm excited for this to bloom. I don't know what happened to all of my labels. They're all gone. <laughs> Whatever, I don't care anymore. I have too many plants. I think we're up to like over a hundred plants in here. Um, okay, so this plant I absolutely love and adore. This is one of my diff, this is my only Diffenbachia, which I started this guy from two little like chunks like this. And I had the hardest time getting it to really take off. And the reason was, is that I simply just didn't have enough soil um, surrounding the base of the plant. It was like a little bit exposed. Like I had rooted it in water, planted it up, but I guess I did that classic error 101, uh, which is not providing enough soil kind of at the base of the plant and allowing a little bit of exposure to happen and it just would not grow. So I added like one half of an inch of soil more immediately it started to take off. Now, Diffenbachia is one of my favorite plants for uh, like more dark, shadier areas of your house plant areas. Um, this would be comparable to a snake plant in terms of light needs. So that makes it very desired in my eyes. I have too many grow lights in here. I keep getting comments from people, uh, you know, that I should save on electricity and not use these grow lights. And that is true. We keep our house at 62 degrees so I can afford to pay for the electricity of the, of the grow lights. Um, but it's true, I am considering turning off the grow lights because it's just, it's a lot of electricity. But it's also my job to keep these happy and share what I find with all of you guys. So I don't know what to do. So this over here is my anthurium, which I haven't had a flower in a couple of months. Now this guy was, really battling from some sort of viral infection. And I had like, I had a, like three or four anthuriums that I had to throw away because they all got the same similar uh, virus on their leaves. And what would happen would like the, around the edges of the leaves would just start to turn brown and then it would just start to take over the entire leaf. And I just cut them out, cut them out, cut them out. And I think I was spreading them by just not keeping, not, not not <laughs> houseplant gardening uh, mistake one uh, number two not cleaning your tools between plant cleanings and i i do it too i we all get lazy and that's no excuse but anyways so i've just really taken this plant has taken a toll and i've eliminated so many leaves over the last six months 12 months and it's just you know it looks like i'm actually getting some new leaves that aren't impacted by that virus. So hopefully I got rid of that virus and it looks like it's doing better. And it's just in this bomb cool pot, isn't this? I got this for like 15 bucks at some uh, secondhand store like five years ago. Never could figure out what to put in it till I put this in it. I was like, oh, that's the plant. Ah, the classic Dracaena fragrans. This is the, the really thick, uh, like three inch diameter version. This is the one that my family sells. We sell them as a unrooted cutting that you basically you take the the cutting and you place it in water for maybe up to six months till you can get some roots to form. And then it starts to produce this um, nice beautiful foliage, which is just, I love that lemony lime look. This plant is just, it's one of my favorites. It is a family classic. It is a family heirloom. I remember when I was in high school, we used to have one of these just on, on like the, side table in my family room. We've always had them because they're such beautiful low maintenance plants and they fulfill a really cool little niche in your house plant or in your home, in your home indoor garden. Um, it's just a very unique energy and look about it. And I'll show you guys a bigger one that I have in my living room here in a minute. 
but this plant has been with me for quite some time and I keep it in this small pot because I just like to keep it small um, and just tuck it in over wherever I want it. Oh my gosh, and if you saw my video about this plant, the Burl Marks philodendron, you know this is one of my favorite plants in my houseplant jungle. I'll show you guys a close up why I love this so much. Quick side note, YouTube only allows you to put like three of those like side links up there. So I have tons and tons of videos about like so many of the different plants in here. Just check my channel. Um, the best way to find all the different videos if you're looking for a specific topic is go through my playlist. I have it pretty well organized, I think. Um, if you can't find something or if you're looking for something, hit me up. Anyways, so the Burl Marx philodendron named after the classic garden designer, Roberto Burl Marx, who actually, and so I'm out here in uh, Westchester, Pennsylvania, not far from Longwood Gardens, which is a world famous garden. And it was the last remaining location of a Roberto Burl Marx garden. And they're currently like redoing it. So does that mean it's still his garden or is there no more in North last remaining in North America, I should say, in the United States. Um, anyways, check this plant out. Just look how it floats. It's just so effortless. Oh and yes, of course, this is a variegated version. Um, you can see some cool little minty looking variegation just like that. But if you look at that stem, you see how strong it is and the, it just kind of flows down and all the foliage just elegantly floats. I think it's a perfect companion, uh, perfect accompaniment to the corner of this furniture. Now, up here, you can see this is my Anthurium vitrifolium. Now, this is also a wonderful ornament for the corner. Look how long that foliage is getting. It's almost like five feet long. Let's see if we can see what it looks like in the soil. Super chunky soil. It needs great drainage. It has a very small pot for the size of that plant, so it allows it to really drain out quickly. Very important. You know, pretty much all anthuriums come from like uh, the tropical jungle rainforest with wonderful drainage. So they always need to have like that really nice kind of thick, chunky um, soil substrate that allows it to drain quickly, but also having, you know, most of our tropical houseplants want to be grown in a very small, tight container, at least until they really start to take off. Then you can gradually upsize them. So if you're struggling with some of your tropicals and you look at the size of the pot, if it's in too large of a pot, it might not do that well. Consider down potting it, downsizing it. So case, case in point is this guy. This is my philodendron lemon lime that my little sister gave to me. And I had this growing in way too big of a pot and it just didn't do anything. So I downsized it, it took off, and then I upsized it again. So that's kind of the way you gotta figure it. You gotta start small and let it really, you know, they're used to really intense competition out in nature. And so what that means for you is like, they don't wanna be swimming in soil. If they're swimming in soil, that means they're really relaxed and they're chill. They don't need to grow to survive and to create roots that compete with the roots of those around them. So having them in a small container helps them to um, feel like they're competing. Now I have a nice selection of succulents right now um, that I got from The Next Gardener. I did a little collaboration with them and they sent me some beautiful succulents. I can't remember what any of them are called. Living out here in Pennsylvania, succulents aren't such a big deal because most people don't know how to care for them in an area that gets cold winters like this. I should probably make a video about that um, and also learn what the different succulents I have are in the process, but this is one of my favorites. I've got like 10 of our Pilea pepperomoyoides. By now, we all are familiar with this plant. Um, also called the friendship plant because they produce all these little baby pups which you can just like pluck right out and prop it up and give it away as a gift. I actually just gave like 10 away at my yoga studio the other day. Um, another, I had a fun comment recently, it was like, coleus aren't indoor plants. Well, I don't know. I have a couple in my indoor garden and they're doing pretty nice. I think this is coleus Fifth Avenue. The thing with coleus, what makes them kind of difficult to grow inside is if you, outside they're great to get large. Uh, inside, you don't want to let them get big. You know, this is almost due for a, a little hair trimming because when they, 
they just don't produce strong enough stems when they're inside. So you really have to be cutting them back all pretty regularly in order to make them look acceptable. So right here is this fun little planter of a little jade and some little cactus dude and some other succulent. I don't know. My uncle gave these to me. He didn't tell me what they were. Thanks, Uncle Court. Uh, but this guy over here, well, this guy over here, now this is a Christmas cactus. This is an heirloom Christmas cactus that my friend gave me. It was his grandmother's Christmas cactus, and they had a, the plant was like three feet around, and um, she passed away, and she had this big plant. They divided it into like 10 pieces. He gave me one of them. It's like 40 years old, and it has the most beautiful pale pink. It's like pale pink, like my sweater, actually. The most beautiful pale pink flowers I have ever seen on a Christmas cactus. I cannot wait for it to bloom. It looks like it's starting to bud up. Let's see, can we get in close and see? Is the camera gonna focus? Those looks like some buds. So another corner piece beauty would be this guy, the Bocarnea Recurvata. The ponytail palm, look how gorgeously it fills out a corner. I just love it. Um, uh, you know, and it has this really nice kind of uh, codex trunk, which makes it very perfect plant for like drought tolerance inside the home. So if you are a traveler or a forgetter, or you forget to water, uh, this is one of the best plants to grow. It's awesome, it's unique, and it really requires very little water. Now let's look at some of the other succulents I got from the, from the next gardener. Check this out. Look at this beautiful pot. I just love it. It's really hard to get all these kind of colors in a houseplant garden in Pennsylvania. Um, so what I've got going on, I have this, this is called the Plant Spectrum 32 watt LED light by uh, Mother Lighting System. It's a little pricey, but it is amazing. When it comes to succulents, they need a lot of light. And most homes cannot provide the sufficient lighting for your succulents inside during the winter. So that's why I splurged and I got this nice high end lighting system that provides enough light for my succulents. The other thing is when we're growing our succulents over the winter, very, very minimal water, you know, once a month, that's all. Um, one of the other succulents that I'm so thrilled to have finally is the burrow's tail, donkey tail succulent. It's so cute, it's so elegant. I've fallen in love with this plant every time I ever see it. Um, I just can't wait for it to really fill out and have that night overflowing look and fill out another corner. Let's see what else I have. I actually can visualize the name of this second in my head, but it's some really crazy name. It's purple, it's beautiful. It's like some sort of like Russian name or something. Um, I'll put it on, you'll be able to see it. But this guy is perfect in this terracotta. Purple and terracotta, have you ever seen a better combo? Not me. And then what else? I have one, one more cool succulent. The blues and the, you know, the light greens is like, it's so gorgeous. How's that lighting look? Pretty good. Succulents are not gonna grow for you over the winter time, but you can allow them to maintain their life over the winter time. And that's by having that lighting and very little water. You provide too much water, not enough lighting, chances are they're gonna rot. Now, speaking of rocking and rolling, look at this guy. Look how beautiful that is. It just, just, it just tripled in size over summertime. I had it outside in the summertime with great sun, wonderful lighting, wonderful water. This is a Daiso cactus. They call it Daiso cactus Napoleon Bonaparte. I'm not sure. Um, it's bloomed before, but it's never bloomed with that many flowers. This baby has buds all stinking over it. I cannot wait to see them bloom. Now I am actually pretty nervous because, so this was outside, I'm in October right now. It was outside and we were getting, you know, cued on our weather.com that it was gonna get cold into the 30s and it has flower buds on it. I said, what do I do? What do I do? Do I leave it outside? let it go on its natural pattern and hope that it doesn't get so cold and it's able to still bloom outside? Or do I bring it inside, 
ensure that it's protected from those cold weathers, but take the risk that I'm disrupting its blooming cycle by changing its weather patterns, by having it inside in the middle of the budding up stage, I don't know. That was about a week ago and it's still budding up and the buds seem to be getting a little bit bigger. So fingers crossed that it's gonna be a-okay. I'll keep you updated on this one because this one is exciting. Now this one is also exciting. This is my variegated Syngonium. Look at that beautiful white variegation. It is stunning. And I have it growing up both this dowel rod as well as this post on my cabinet thingy right here. So um, it's kind of stuck in place. So the reason why I've started to like just let everything kind of crawl and grow up everything is because I got sick. I had so many like handmade, homemade trellises everywhere. It was just like, Trellis, 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 trellis. I got, I started to go crazy. I didn't like it. Um, and so now I have gone the other way and I'm just letting things climb up the furniture, which that kind of makes them like stuck where they are. It's like the only way I'm gonna be able to like move them is if I like chop them back and then move it. We'll see what time tells. Over here, I have the classic um, Tradescantia uh, Nanook. Nice and beautiful purple pink variegation. Ooh, this looks nice back here. And that's also combined with another variegated Syngonium that's growing in here. And you can see I have this guy, this Nanook is kind of flowing all over the place. I have it kind of grown out there, grown. So I still have that fish wire, so it's kind of just flowing over that way. And then the Syngonium is also in that same pot and it's just kind of making its way up here. Pretty cool. So my Clivia miniata did not bloom for me this year. Um, I suspect it's because it just didn't get good enough lighting. I didn't have it outside over the summer because, I don't know, I just, I can't bring everything outside. I can only bring, you know, what I really have room for. So no, full, no flowers, but the foliage is looking beautiful, strappy and leathery as ever. This continues to be one of my favorite house plants that really not many people grow, Clivias, um, just because the, you know, that form is so unique and so beautiful. And they really don't have, like they love to be kind of confined in their pot. Like check out that, like just check that out. That's intense. Yeah, this has been grown in here for like five years and it's just created this incredible root system totally fills out this container, so low key, so low maintenance, and yet so absolutely stunningly beautiful, even more beautiful when it flowers, but without the flowers, it's still at the top of my list. Another plant that's at the top of my list and at the top of many people's lists would be jade, the classic jade, Crassula ovata. Now you can see all this fresh growth I have going on right here, that's because this was also outside over summer and it just, takes off. You put it outside for summertime, absolutely shines. You know, as a succulent, it's really hard, like I said, to get enough light for them inside the home. Um, so putting it outside in the summer, you know, it's like shots of wheatgrass for the plant. It really makes them strong and healthy and then they actually do better over the winter time. So if you're not doing that yet for some of your succulents, start doing that. Um, I have a very nice in-depth video all about uh, growing jade, including root pruning, which can help to increase the thickness of your main stem, which I know a lot of people love that. I know I do. So check that video out. Now up here, I have my Hoya publicalix and you can see the stems are actually grow. I have them growing out that way. Um, and I have them connected over, over there. I'll see if I can remember to show you guys that later, but this one with these little mottled foliage, so pretty. And it just, this is one of those, you know, 110 trellises I had um, all around my house plant garden before. And this one just still has its trellis. So yeah, it's great. I haven't had any flowers yet, but hopefully soon. Now down here is another plant growing up my wall. So this is the Raphidophora discursiva, the dragon tail. You can see why they kind of call it dragon tail. Kind of looks like it. You know, that's like a baby dragon tail. Um, I don't have any full dragon tails yet, but it's getting there. 
This one's really nice because it produces such a nice, thick, strong stem. And um, it really grows like a new leaf every like two weeks. So I started this from like a, a four inch pot like a year ago and it has grown like 10 feet. <laughs> so over here I have the Hunchback of Notre Dame, of Notre, of Notre Dame, uh, Pilea peppermioides. <laughs> This, the stem got too big and too long, it couldn't support its own growth, so now it's got the hunchback. But I think it looks pretty cool like that. If you don't have one of these in your house, what are you doing? Where have you been? They're so easy and cool. So here you can see, this is actually a plant that I'm taking care of for my parents. Um, they're doing some traveling right now, so they asked me to take care of about five or 10 plants for them. No problem, just add them to the jungle. Uh, this is an adenium, first of like 10 you'll see in my garden. These are all new additions since my last house plant tour. Adenium are great, cool plants. A little tricky to grow. They really need to be started in springtime, like late spring, early summertime. If you live in an environment with cold winters, it's almost impossible to have a successful adenium that you start in like October. You gotta start them outside before you bring them inside so they need warm winter weather like 45 is pretty much the cutoff um, but what happens is they make these really thick fat fat bellies i like to call them also called a codex um, which is where it's like the storehouse of water um, so it's a succulent and then they produce really stunning flowers these flowers are similar ish in like shape to like a frangipani plumeria, but they, they blow plumeria flowers out of the water in terms of like color and like just in sheer beauty. Plumeria has the fragrance which cannot be touched, but I mean, this guy's budding up. A lot of times they'll bud up and then they'll drop their flowers. That seems to be a pretty normal thing. Um, happened to me quite a few times, but for every like 10 buds you get, it'll probably drop like eight of them and the other two will bloom and that's still worth it. So over here I have this mixed pot of, this is my Peru Monstera, um, Monstera Carstenianum. You can see it's growing pretty nicely all the way up there and uh, it's just taken off. It's also growing over there. You can see. <laughs> And then I have in the pot with it this like, I can't remember the exact species, but this is another Tradescantia uh, inch plant. Um, I don't know, it, I thought it was a cool combo, cool coloration combo. And this is a nice like drape, draping look about it. So down here is one of my favorite plants. It's super low key, it's super beautiful, and it's a banana. This is the Cavendish banana, so they stay really small. Now this was a pup growing from a larger mother plant um, and the mother plant really recently passed away. It had just, you know, banana plants have like a time limit. Normally out in the, Car the Caribbean or wherever they're like a real bananas where you're harvesting fruit, what they do out there is they, they grow them in a season, they produce fruit and then they just chop them back and you know, babies typically will, will sprout up. And this was a baby that sprouted up and the mama plant passed away. Um, but look how cute and gorgeous it is. They need a lot of lighting and they need a lot of water. Otherwise, they are easy as can be. Here you can see another adenium. Now as a second, these ones are hugely important to keep dry throughout the winter time. Um, a lot of times people will overwater them and then they turn rotten. Um, and you know, that's not good. Here we have the Philodendrons Florida ghost, which it's like a, di I don't know if it's really a Florida ghost. Some people tell me it's not. Some people tell me it's different. Um, a little bit like more like creamy kind of variegation. Now this is a culprit of why I was telling you guys earlier, they want to start them in a small pot. This is too big of a pot. It just, this hasn't done anything for, 10 months, why have I not planted it back into a smaller pot? I've asked myself that almost every day. And yes, here is one of my fiddly figs um, with its head chopped off. 
Did you see my video about air layering this guy? It was a success, it was awesome. And look, it's growing already again. Just as I suspected. So I had my vanilla plant outside all summer and it also just took off in growth. It doesn't look very tall. And the reason is because after it had grown a lot, I, you know, I re went back and forth on the trellis. And so it's actually like 12 foot tall. It just is sitting at like two and a half feet because I've just threaded it back and forth. Um, but uh, I love it. It's cool. It's not my only orchid in my garden anymore, but it is my most treasured orchid in my garden. Now over here is the fiddle leaf fig that was this, this was the result of the air layer from my other fiddle leaf fig. I did the air layer, I chopped it off, and this was the result, and it's doing great. Fiddle leaf figs are not hard to grow. I don't know what, what the big deal is. <laughs> they can be a little challenging sometimes. So here is my other clivia, and same thing, didn't bloom for me, but it looks great, it's awesome. It has just like this arching, strappy leather foliage. Now, down here is my golden brush plant. Um, and same thing, I, you know, it's an error that I harp on other people a lot because I do it too. Um, and it's by accident because, you know, we put, we pot something up, we put all the soil into it and then we water it and then some of the soil around the crown of the plant kind of just washes away and some of that area around the crown gets exposed and then we just never get around to filling it back up unless you have someone like me telling you, put some soil there. Well, I didn't have anyone to tell me that and I left some of it, I just didn't have enough soil around the crown of that plant and it just didn't grow for a year. Um, but then I put some soil and it started to grow. So, all right, some, some of us are slower to learn than others. <laughs> So here we have our classic ficus elastica. Well, it's a little wet, wetter than it should be. Good thing I'm doing this tour. Have some water sitting in here. So good thing it's in a small container um, so that it's not been swimming in wetness for too long. Like I was telling you guys earlier, keep our tropicals in these small containers and that just helps it to utilize the water more efficiently. And if you do happen to overwater it, then the, the damage is much smaller. So here I have another coleus. This is coleus Fifth Avenue. Now in a second, I'll show you guys the same exact plant that's been getting more sunlight, huge difference. A super forgiving plant, which I neglect nonstop would be uh, this Peperomia obtusifolia. Has pretty fun little variegation, kind of a reddish stem. And a lot of times when it gets too long, it'll actually break and then you're forced to make it into a propagation. So I have like four of them running around here. Great plant, succulent, easy to care for. I don't give it much attention at all. Now next to it is this guy. This is my begonia dragon wings. This is, looks about ready for a chop back. This guy is getting big. Um, when you're growing begonia dragon wings inside, it's, I think it's important to trim it back. Someone was saying online, oh, you're missing the point of growing them. They're supposed to get tall and top heavy. Are they? I don't really think so because when they do that, then they break um, and they just are a, a, a kind of a mess. So I like to keep mine rather shorter and compact. Um, it's also just a, a nice plant to have for a less than optimal lighting condition. Kind of just a nice little corner, just like that. Blocks all my cords. Now next to that is my Anthurium Petitori Diatom in bloom, might I add. See that flower over there? This guy has some of the most cool, unique, large leaves in my home. They're so fun. With my Meyer lemon. My Meyer lemon is not looking great. I'm not gonna lie. So my Meyer lemon over here, it's not looking great because it was actually, it was kind of grown out of season. It was forced at the wrong time of year in a greenhouse. Then I took it out of the greenhouse. Then I grew it on my patio. 
and then I brought it in home and blah, blah, blah. And then ball, it's just not doing great. Hopefully it'll perk up right now. I don't know, probably, maybe not, we'll see. Um, another one of my favorite plants in my home is this agave. I think it's agave macrocantha. I have some disputes with that. I'm not totally sure. Um, but this guy is a really beautiful blue agave. Got it as a Christmas gift about four years ago and from a really old time grower. And it's made its way with me all over the place. So um, bring some nice memories when I look at this plant. Now, another plant that I am so thrilled that I brought outside for the summertime is my pink princess, my philodendron pink princess. It's not the most pink princess, most pink pink princess you've ever seen, but it's just, it's a pink princess. I mean, look at it. The maroon stems, the beautiful deep dark foliage, it's just phenomenal. And having it outside, it was about this tall when I put it outside, so it about doubled in size over summertime. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So here is another philodendron that my sister gave me. This is the philodendron painted lady, called painted lady because it looks like the leaves are sort of like splotchy painted and some ruby kind of stemming action going on. You can see it looks really nice and it's just a nice size plant in this small size container. That's how you do it with the tropicals. Let them fill it out. Another Pilea, another Sansevieria. Oh, here you can see this is my Crystal Hope, my Anthurium Crystal Hope. Also, had this guy out all summer long and it's doing so much better because of it. This was in like a really nice kind of like sheltered shady area. It just loved that warm weather. My Philodendron Silver Sword. Oh, Philodendron Hastatum is looking like it's about ready for a pot and up. Of course, it's called Silver Sword because the foliage looks like silver swords. And then underneath this table, I put some more grow lights, of course, and I have a nice Plumeria frangipani, which has already started to defoliate. I have some more of our desert rose growing. One of my mother's Phalaenopsis right here. Um, doing all right. And then another desert rose. Now this big mama is my philodendron little Phil, not so little anymore, is he? Um, I think cause it's so big, I just forget about him a lot of the time, but clearly this is an important part of my houseplant jungle. It really harnesses this corner and it's the entry plant that you see when you walk into this space. So hugely important to have a few plants that are large and in charge. If you remember Pee Wee Herman, large Marge is in charge, something like that. So this wildly wicked plant is my um, Scadoxis multiflorus, uh, also called the blood lily. Check that video out. These grew from bulbs into beautiful spherical blooms in about a month. Really, really amazingly cool. And now that has this beautiful foliage on these large, strong stems related to the amaryllis, um, if that's any clue to how wonderful of a plant they are. And then next to it is my mangavi, my pineapple surprise, pineapple express mangavi. My God, this has just, it, this is just finally filled out this container and it looks so phenomenal. I deal, dealt with scale on this for a really long time. And this summer I finally beat it, I think so, finally combated it. Um, and this guy's just holding down this little corner right on the ground just like that, really pretty. Now here you can see that exact same coleus, Fifth Avenue, and look at that color difference. It's much brighter, much more vibrant, so nice. The difference where the little sun can give to us. So this right here is my other zigzag cactus. Now I think that this one is the Selenocereus, Anthocyanus, it has a thicker, more leathery foliage than the other one. Um, and they tend to be a little bit wider. I actually have a bigger plant over there. We'll show you guys here in a minute, but check it out. It's always so fun to have a couple fun, playful pots just like this, isn't it? I like it. So if you, if you were wondering, yes, I built this. Samantha and I built this cool corner unit for my house plans. I just designed it, we built it in about a few hours and it's perfect 
for this little corner by this window, by this door window thing. And housed perfectly right in the middle is this beautiful Anthurium crystallanum. Still one of my favorite plants in my home. That foliage is just enchanting. It's magical. It's fairy tale esque And then next to it, I have this, this is um, Senecio Blue, which out in California, I was just there recently, that's like a ground cover everywhere out there. Um, here, it's just a cool little succulent house plant and I love it. And it has a really beautiful blue color that matches with that vibrant orange terracotta pretty well. Now this beautiful plant in pot container, gotta say shout out to my good friend, Glenn. He gifted me this beautiful vintage container from the 1940s and I have filled it with my whale fin snake plant. I think the combination is deserving of a prominent place in my house plant garden. It's phenomenal. Look at that. Absolutely beautiful. Now, what I actually did was I have a, there's no rule book when it comes to gardening. So if you wanna put a terracotta inside another clay pot, do it. Oi. Don't worry, the shelving is sturdy. Nice little pothos cutting that I got from this pothos up here. Pothos, you know, I have a lot of plants. Always have room for a pothos. And then this guy right here is just another cutting that I took of my philodendron burl marks, the variegated one. Um, doing well. So that pretty much completes the tour of this room. Now let's go check out the rest of the home. So. Moving into the rest of the home, here we are in our living room. And what do you see? You see this like 20 year old money plant. Um, this is the Pachira, Pachira aquatica. Look at this guy, huge leaves. Have you ever seen a money plant with leaves that are that big? This guy has some wonderful energy and genetics into it. And look at that thick fat trunk. I think it's like a triple or maybe a quint tuplet braid going on. Phenomenal. And it's in a super small pot. It's perfect because I don't want the plant to get any bigger. <laughs> and it's fall, so we have some pumpkins out here. Now, another wonderful shade loving house plant would be a, a lot of the different aglaonemas. I don't remember which aglaonema this is, Chinese evergreens. This guy has been sitting in a corner, just hanging out for months and months and months, and it still looks great. So this would be in the category with um, our Diffenbachia and our snake plants as a stalwart for the shady home. And like I was mentioning, I have a bigger, this is my larger Dracaena fragrans, the totem pole. And um, you know, this was a plant that last year it got sunburnt, so I had to chop all of the foliage back and give it a chance to regrow. And it's taken like a whole year to kind of like regain its stature. But here it is doing well. Oh, and like I was telling you guys, this is the result of a broken branch. Made two little plants, two little cuttings right in here. Perfect, I just stuck them in the soil, a little bit of water, forgot about them, and they get no sunlight and they don't care. And of course, the centerpiece to our table is a classic Sansevieria snake plant. It's just so easy, it's so elegant. It's just always there and it's always looking great. So clearly the decorating style in here is different from my house plant jungle. It's a little bit more refined, a little bit more elegant. It's definitely Samantha's vision of incorporating plant life with our furniture in a way that's like seamless. And um, you know, having that plant like divide up the couch, the large money plant divide up that couch, it just functions, it's, it's easy to do. And um, not going overboard, not going overkill, just having it nice and simple with a few plants that are really easy to grow and that you can guarantee are gonna be looking good. A lot of the house plants in my, in my house plant jungle, they need a lot more care. These plants I can forget about because I'm not looking at them 24 seven like I am in my, in my office and that's perfect, that's what I need. So, you know, something to keep in mind. So another thing that I've definitely tried to create throughout the house with Samantha is to ensure that no matter where I'm looking, I'm always seeing at least one plant in my vision. So now we're here in the kitchen. Now I'm in the kitchen and I can look towards the living room and I see plants there, plants there. I see this beautiful monstera here. 
I see a snake plant here. In here I see a few little baby plants over there. I turn the corner, I see some more plants there. And having all those plant and having all that plant life pretty much everywhere makes me feel good. <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm can, you know, that I'm not in some sort of sterile environment like there's life around me. And it's, you don't have to have 120 plants like I do. You can just have a few plants, 12, 13, 20, and you can accomplish that. Um, now one plant that is, I feel like is an accomplishment, just be, not for me, um, an accomplishment of mother nature is this Monstera. Monstera, there's a reason it's so popular. They're so easy to grow, they're fast, and they're absolutely stunningly beautiful. Now let me show you guys a little trick that you can do. If you find that your Monstera is kind of stunting in growth, um, this is what you can do to encourage a little bit extra growth. So I have slowly over time taken the aerial roots and what I do is I put them in water. Now you can see those aerial roots are now absorbing water. They're, you know, they have all those smaller roots that are absorbing the water right there. And that is definitely providing moisture, sustenance to my Monstera and it's allowing it to grow even healthier. And we just had this big mama plant open up last week, or this big mama leaf open up last week. So moving into this next room, this is like my greenhouse, I, my greenhouse room, my preparation room where I actually do a lot of the planting up, propagating, all that sort of stuff. Um, let's see in here. So I don't have a ton going on in here right now. I just have a couple of extra uh, Pilea peppermuoides growing a little begonia growing, kind of small. Um, I just got this big box of amaryllis bulbs. So if you don't know, my family and I were actually vendors on the TV channel called QVC here in the United States. And that's like my main job is I, um, I present plants on TV. And that's one of the reasons why I have so many plants. The other reason is because I just absolutely adore them. And one of the things I absolutely adore in this room is this. This cute little hanger section. I have another philodendron, Burl Marks growing, another Tradescantia, Nanook, and a small little pink princess, all propagations from some of my other plant material. Now as we move this way, you can see my little snake plant, which gets very much no attention at all, but it looks good. And then we move into this room, our little front room. Now this front room has always kind of been a bane of our existence here in this home. We could never really figure out what to do with it. So I built this plant cart, which has functional wheels and it has a lighting system right here and filled it with plants. And now the room is kind of cool. I have some more amaryllis bulbs, um, a few failing opsis here growing, you can see. Um, it's always a good sign if your failing opposite is, pro is producing new aerial roots, which mine is, so that makes me happy. And right here you can see my original mama zigzag cactus, the what I think is a Selenocereus anthocyanosis, and that's definitely an old bee's hornet's nest. What does this look like to you guys? Can you see it in there? That doesn't look good. I'm gonna get rid of that. Is there anything in there? I don't know. Now I'm scared. Okay, I'll deal with that later. Um, so this plant has been abused, abused and abused and abused. I have burnt this like three years in a row. I take it outside thinking it's gonna enjoy some sunlight and I always give it like one hour of sunlight and burnt. So th actually this year I didn't burn it because I learned my lesson and I put it under the shade of a tree for the entire summer and that was a pretty nice habitat for it. Um, but you can see the growth between this one and the other one, that very first one, this is much more kind of splayed out. The other one is much more kind of compact and growing. Um, 
This is a little bit more wild. That's a little bit more well kempt. So I don't know. Choose your, choose your pick. Pick them both. And this enormous Epiphyllum hookeri is a family heirloom that's been in the family for like 20 years. And it just, it's getting huge. I cut this back by like 50% like two months ago and it's still so big. When they get so big, they just get floppy and they, I don't like the floppiness as much. If you saw my video where it was in bloom, um, when it was really nice and like strong stems, that, strong leaves that were really upright, that was my happy time with this plant. Now it's just kind of a little bit overbearing in the size that it takes up. But for this type of plant over the winter, I will give it minimal sunlight and like one cup of water every two months, like none. That way it doesn't have any sort of like uneven growth. The thing about succulents cactus if over winter time, if they don't get sufficient light and you still water it, they will grow, but the growth will be very weak and often uneven leading to um, a dismal result. So it's better to let it totally dry with insufficient light. It won't grow at all, but it also won't grow unevenly. Now this cute little fern is um, a variegated fern. I don't remember which one it was, what, what, what it was called. It's like a variegated Boston fern. Um, and this has been a really nice plant. Honestly, it's been great. It's had some periods where it was like a little bit strung out, but you know, got to keep it moist, uh, not in too much light. It doesn't want a whole lot, heck of a lot of light. And so a position like this, where it gets a little bit of offshoot of the window action and a little bit of that grow light is perfect. I keep it moist and it's happy. A little elevation also gives it room to uh, feel the air flow between its hairs like the wind in your convertible Corvette. And this cute little guy, this is a little cute little uh, hand, gla hand blown glass um, drinkware. I got it at an antique shop. It's now full of air plants. All right, so now let's walk upstairs. You can see right away some hanging plant life. So I am just always thrilled by philodendron. They're just such great plants. If you want something tropical and easy, get something from the genus philodendron. This is philodendron micans. Now, what a beautiful hanger this is. So what I did was I just built this cool little hanging system. Uh, Samantha stained it and I plugged it into the um, stud in the wall and it's actually pretty cool. And then it's just hanging down like this, growing and flowing making its way down, really pretty. Now over here is this little anthurium which has that virus I was telling you about. Look at it, horrible, horrible. That's why it's in this place of neglect, neglected child because it's ugly. No, I'm just kind of letting it do its thing, see what happens. I'm done trying to treat it. And look at this beautiful hanging Chinese Pilea peperomioides. I made matching uh, plant hangers, of course, and this guy is quite the hanger, I must admit. Now over here you can see just a couple more amaryllis just hanging out, not doing much. And my one and only spider plant with one baby spider. Pretty good for this neglected corner with another one of those coleus from earlier. I can't remember what it's called. So, and finally, moving into the bedroom, we have the very last plant. What better plant to end the tour on than another snake plant? I just gotta admit, you can't beat snake plants when it comes to ease and effortlessness, but everyone here on this channel is already well aware of that. Anyways, I think that's gonna end the tour. My throat's starting to get sore from talking so much. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. Maybe you had a little inspiration and enjoyed the whole house plant tour of our home here in Eastern Pennsylvania out in Chester County. Anyways, if you did enjoy the video, think about giving it that little like button, uh, subscribe to the channel. We're offering, you know, we're producing new videos every single week 
and as you know every Sunday morning is when these videos come live I'm starting to lose my train of thoughts I am hungry and ready to go eat some plant material so at that I will bid you farewell and I will see you guys here on Plant Vibrations with me Devin Walleen thank you guys I'll catch you soon ciao